that's for sure. Oh, should we rock and roll? We should. Uh, okay. Well, I, I do want to say something falling from what Joanna said, which I thought yeah. was really interesting that has to do with staff and then maybe we could kick it off. Yeah. Um, she was talking about the kind of like inquiry form that parents don't want to do um, and mm -hmm. staff don't want to fill out a long thing. <sighs> Potential staff don't want to fill out a long thing either. So I think some of the lessons from marketing to parents just apply to marketing to these yeah. staff. And that's what we're yeah. going to talk about today. So Scott, back to you. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Look at this amazing panel we have in front of us. Um, I and Thanks, everybody, for, for tuning into this. Thank you uh, even more for donating uh, to get to tune into this. Uh, my name is Scott Arazala. I'm a summer camp consultant and trainer. Uh, and we are all on this webinar to uh, benefit Camp Stomping Ground. And so Jack is here. I'm going to kick it over to him for a minute. He can tell you all a little bit about that project and why we're all, why you're looking at all these amazing faces. Jack. Yeah, thanks so much everybody for coming back or joining us for the first time today. Yesterday's rec recordings are up and you should have gotten an email about where they are. If you didn't, just email me and I'll get you taken care of. I'm really grateful for Scott and Kurtz for organizing this and Joanna and Travis and Kurt for being here today to help uh, us give us a, a forever home at Stomping Ground. I never would have thought that we'd be trying to purchase a property um, when I emailed Travis 10 years ago now, um, something along those lines and said, hey, I'm this weird guy that wants to drive around the country and see some camps. And I, what could I, I don't know. And he said, hey, give me a call and uh, kind of pushed us forward and uh, gotten so much help along the way. So thank you so much for being here. We um, are going into our seventh, no, sixth summer. We're going to first grade with uh, Stomping Ground this summer and we'll have about 130 kids playing in the woods. And it's gonna be possible because of all of you um hanging out on this webinar um donating and making it possible so thank you so much you all are making um kids dreams come true uh right now which is really cool and we get to learn some really awesome stuff from this awesome panel uh talking about recruiting staff which is near and dear to my heart because i still need some staff so i'm going to shut up <laughs> and uh let y'all uh teach me something cool uh, I'll kick it over to um, Sarah to introduce herself in a minute and then of course our panelists. I do want to tell you Jack and everybody watching that one of the reasons why we were so inspired to throw this together uh, is because of the story uh, behind Stomping Ground. It's really amazing to watch a camp go from nothing to something when I think a lot of times what we're hearing in our industry is the sort of opposite where camps are closing or they're having a hard time staying open and putting heads in beds and whatnot. So um, it's an inspiration to, to be around you guys and your energy and all that hustle that I think we all clearly identify with. So thank you. Um, Sarah, you want to introduce yourself and then we'll let our panelists uh, introduce themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm also a camp consultant trainer and I also live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and I work with Jack very closely um, to run a professional development community called the Summer Camp Society. So um, I'm a stomping and girl and I'm really pumped to be here. Um, I should also share that we have a chat window go. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a speech bubble that says chat. And if you open that up, um, you'll find some commentary, links, um, helpful tips throughout our time together. Um, you can also um, submit any questions or if you don't understand something, that's kind of your voice in the webinar. So please use that and we'll monitor it throughout the course of um, the time together. So um, how about Joanna? Why don't you uh, go ahead and us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay. Hi, I'm Joanna Warren Smith. Um, I've worked with camp for lots of years, and I guess my claim to fame has, has two elements. Uh, one, I visited, uh, over, visited, assessed over 400 camps throughout the country and internationally. And over the past eight years, um, I've begun working with focus groups of parents. Uh, parents who, um, whose children go to camp, parents whose, whose families negate camp after they've been to the programs, and they, have, they keep me honest. Um, you know, it's not camping according to me, it's, it's uh, the perspective of parents um, is, is, is incredibly insightful, and it allows me to be as, as impactful as I can be with my clients. I think it's you, Travis. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Travis Allison from GoCamp.Pro. Um, probably most of your first experiences with me are in um, using the Summer Camp Professionals group on Facebook that, uh, 
that we created and that we run. And uh, we also run a lot of other professional development and training for year-round summer camp people. Awesome. Well, you guys, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, as you guys know, and of course, everybody who's watching, we were really going to talk about staffing and uh, it's really taking a marketing sort of lens or approach to all that. So I was wondering if either of you guys, maybe Joanna or, or, or Travis, if you guys have just an idea about how, how do we even sort of think about this idea through that lens of marketing? I mean, it's not your typical approach, basically, to thinking yeah. about staffing. So how would we do it? And maybe even start with why. Why, why is that an interesting way to look at it? And, and how will that lead us to something yeah. fruitful, hopefully? I, I think, I think the, the new normal, um, all the ground rules have changed. You know, there was some uh, calendar uh, that said you, you know, you start staff recruitment in January and you conclude it in May. You can't do that anymore. It's year round. It has to be year round. Um, it, to get people committed early. I had a number of camps this summer um, who bought into some of the suggestions that we made in the article we published at, in the ACA Camp Magazine um, in, in March, April. And they actually identified the staff, they, the superstars, they wanted to have come back and they let them know. Now you would think that could have a negative effect on the community. But I, I actually had a couple of uh, counselors come up to me during the summer when I was visiting them. And they said, um, I wasn't asked back. Can you watch me and tell me what I can do differently to get on the asked back list? Hmm. So I think the first thing to think about is it's not, it's not seasonal recruitment anymore. Yeah. It's year round. Yeah. And taking the seasonal idea out of it, of course, it broadens it out to, you're right, it's a, it's a whole, it's a part of the big picture, which means there's got to be some ideas of marketing in there. Travis, how would you answer the same question? Well, I think that the most important, let me take one small step back. Like most of your job in camping right now, this feels overwhelming, exhausting, and, you know, et cetera. Like, so much of this just can feel so draining. Uh, I think that at its root, the successful camp recruiters are very good at relationships. And I think that that's a successful camp director too. So if you go back to your roots, you can make this easier. Uh, if you go back to, this is not just a six month relationship. It's not someone we hired in February that we have to keep happy till the middle of August or the end of August. This is a real relationship with real people that we're going to be in touch with, that we're going to build community with, and that we're going to invite into our community throughout the year. And that way, and Joanna and I will be able to talk to you tonight today about um, focus areas, easy wins for this. But I think if you go into this saying, if I can build and, and maintain a community, then I am light years ahead of those people who are complaining you know, posting on Camp Pros in April, yo, where do we post our summer jobs to get people? Like, mm -hmm. too little, too late at that point. Yeah. Uh, and if you do the work throughout the stuff that you focus on, then the stuff that you focus on for the rest of your camp job, then you are going to increase your chances of hiring great staff, not just getting a full complement of staff, but mm -hmm. people who will commit to you, to your camp and to your kids. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of divide this into two sections here. We have retention and acquisition, right? If we're looking at it through a marketing lens. So I'm hearing you guys say relationship building with um, our returners or our, our returners that we want to return um, and also with new folks. Um, so do you think we could talk about um, the distinction between what we can do with those new folks in terms of a retention kind of approach, and then we could dive into the, the new folks, because I do think um, maybe there are some similarities, but there they should be different strategies between okay. the two. And I believe the retention is the low-hanging fruit. Right. Um, you're absolutely right. But with, let's, let's talk about for a minute getting the acqu new acquisitions and new staff members in, and then the keeping. So first thing, work all of your networks. Go to your, your donors, your alumni, your camper alumni, staff alumni, um, all, all, all the people who know and love you early in the year or 
and by that I'm meaning September, October, or at least before Christmas, and say, you must know a young man or a young woman who could change the lives of kids at our camp. Now, you cannot do this in April, because, and that's back to where, what Travis was just describing. Then you sound desperate, but right now, you've still got a shot at, at reaching out to everyone and just brief, concise to the point at a time when kids are going home, starting to make decisions about their summer jobs, it's an ideal time. So then getting those acquisitions and those new counselors in, and then tell them what's in it for them. Give them a, a benefit list. The same way if they were, if they were um, being employed by a corporation, they would get a benefits package. Give them a benefits package so they can see and you know, see what they will accomplish as a result of having worked at your camp. Yeah, you know what you can include in that. Just yesterday, Dan Weir was talking about how he, uh, at Frost Valley, I'm sure he'll do it this summer at his day camps, uh, used to run a resume building workshop halfway through the summer just so they could get used to how you talk about that stuff. Why aren't we front loading it with that? Why aren't we showing them what a resume looks like after a summer of camp? You know, they, they just put the, gave their resume to you, right? Show them what it looks like afterward. That's a sweet benefit because there's, there's other than, you know, some of those kind of tangible things, a lot of the benefit we're talking about is relationships and networking. You know, right. Ask in, the, in the survey that um, we did for the article in Camping Magazine, um, the uh, 734 counselors indicated that, that the skills that they developed, the life skills and the, um, and the job skills that they developed, conflict resolution, they were just off the charts which yeah. really validates. And remember, you're not just convincing a potential counselor to come work for you. You're convincing their parent not to send them to the internship. Yeah. You're convincing their parent that this is worthwhile. And even though it may not pay as well as flipping burgers. You're also giving the, their parents somebody to call when they desperately want to call somebody, right? Because just because their kid is 20 doesn't mean they don't want to call somebody to work it all out, right? Travis, what do you think as far as recruiting that, that, that new uh, staff member? Well, it, um, <clears throat> I think, and this is, this is the framework that, that both Joanna and I see things through in so many ways, is like, let's make that package of we're looking for this person look good, make it concise, make it easy to understand, give them one paper print off, give them social media uh, things, you just you outline the qualities that you're looking for. Sarah's got a good point. We want to be careful not to discriminate against people who are not college age. Um, and therefore, also not limit ourselves. When we're crying for camp staff and all we're willing to do is go to college job fairs, then we're missing out on some great people who may be like some of the best camp staff have been alumni who've just said, I quit my job in June, um, or I'm going to be done my job in June, and I don't want to start anything till the fall. Could I come back to camp? Please, yes, come back to camp. Yeah. And just in being open and communicating that mm -hmm. that's possible m led to that. And um, you know, we've had alumni uh, or parents of, of campers come to us and, and do that. So be open to all these things, but present this in a good communication way. Say, here's who we're looking for. You know, um, Joanna, do you remember who it was who had that, the, uh, it might've been Jack actually. Jack, did you have that picture with the outline of the counselor, the gray outline of the counselor with kids on either side? Um, it was not me, but I do remember it and I'll find it. So that, that was such an awesome, it was like, this is who we're looking for. Do you fit into this picture? It was just a gray outline, like anyone would have fit in it, but um, it also outlined some of the layers. Somebody in the, in the chat will remember that and be able to find it if Jack doesn't find it first. But, but communicate all the, the parts of the job. So see in somebody else, someone who would fit this job and send that to your network. So make it all... Um, easy to understand and, and easily presented to those people. It's really interesting though, because I thought, uh, you know, we were going to save all the relationship talk for retention strategies, but so far you guys have like swirled around networks. I mean, yeah, Travis, you gave us a lot of good ideas about like, what are we going to do once we kind of connect with our network as far as how do we present that? I'm not just like looking for some camp counselors. I'm, it, you know, putting together a professional piece. I'm, I'm communicating about it clearly. Therein probably lies some really good, interesting marketing avenues to talk about 
what your mission is, what your values are, what your organization is, as opposed to the next camp down the line. Um, how does that then, how is it different then from retention strategies? Joanna, you wanted to, you know, you, you specifically said, well, let's talk about the new ones first and then we'll talk about the retention. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about the retention piece, uh, that, 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 that side now. Well, if you, if you establish that connection through the onboarding and training process, then you owe it to your staff members to be vigilant to their performance. You know, you're in the youth development business and it's not, it's not restricted to ages four through 15. You know, it is 17 to 28 or whatever your mature staff age in at. Um, you're always helping people to perform better. Staff don't wanna be left to their own devices. They want to know what your game plan is, and they want to know that you care about how they're performing. So that relationship starts to develop very strongly when there's a mentoring attitude, and you know, not a big brother is watching attitude, but a mentoring attitude yeah. to help people perform better. I, it's something we actually talked about yesterday in the um, in the sort of generational discussion we were having with Dan Weir and Chris Thurber about you know really being able to offer folks um, not only the why the underneath of things like why we're making the decisions that we're making but they were talking specifically about how the generation of young people working for us now are more apt to to look for exactly what you're talking about that sort of mentorship piece and our our much more oriented towards um, asking for and getting getting feedback. Um, Sarah, I, th I thought I saw a couple of um, questions come up, but I'm obviously not paying attention. Is there, was there something going on over there that we should be talking about? Yeah, there's a few things in the chat, but the one I really, the tip I really want to share was um, from Deborah, um, one of our guests, and she says, I work with an all volunteer run camp. We asked staff at the beginning of the week to quote, look for their paycheck, the reason they are glad they came and or want to come back. Our closing circle is a share out of their paychecks from personal and camper growth to fun and laughter to touching moments of that we kind of put verbiage around what that means. And we don't say it in our recruiting materials. We're doing um, intentional reflection on that throughout the course of the summer and at the end. Um, so I just thought that was a really nice mm -hmm. add on and example. Um, to share. So, um, and we are seeing that um, there are several people on the call who said that they have volunteer staff. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not only talking about recruiting people who get paid. Um, I would say across the board in camping, pay is not the typically leverage if we're looking at this from marketing <laughs> perspective. Um, it's a sensitive way to say that, sure. Yeah. You know, I walked into Whole Foods the other day. Rich, huh? right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, but I think. It is interesting thinking about we have lots of people who don't even have that option um, and who are looking for pure volunteers. So, yeah, that's what's going on in the chat. And that's where the meaningful relationship with the, the staff who are paid um, is so important for the volunteers. And they've got to see meaning to what they're doing because, you know, that's more important to them than a paycheck. So, I mean, I might argue that it, even if you're getting paid, uh, that is probably more meaningful. Again, not, it's because you know one of the things that our industry can't do is is uh, compete with some of the higher paying internships and whatnot, summer opportunities for young people. So we have to be able to talk about the things that they're getting that are above and beyond those those paychecks. Travis, what about you? What do you think when it comes to this retention side as far as how, how do we use these our ideas around relationships, networks, those those things to really drive retention? Uh, so, so yes, definitely relationships, communication. Uh, I think that there are lots of great tools these days for making some of that communication personal, uh, less bulky. I think that we have to accept and acknowledge that email likely won't be the most important and easiest way to reach your staff these days. I was um, surprised, mildly putting it that uh, I saw a staff member, uh, camp director recently say that they require their staff to join a private Facebook group. And that is not your audience. Um, we know even just from the summer camp professionals group that we know that 
uh, directors or owners are getting their young year-round staff to join summer camp professionals, we know that a lot of them have to create their own Facebook account just so they can join summer camp professionals. It's not a place where people are. And um, in the same way that, um, you know, camp directors got grumpy because staff wouldn't answer their phones. We, we have to just get over the fact that staff aren't on Facebook and address them where they are. And so that may be creating other tools. It may be using, you know, a bulk texting thing. It may be, um, we require you to have an email because there's no way for us to get stuff to you, but we'll let you know that that's coming because mm -hmm. through the medium that works for you. And um, it definitely means that camp directors have to explore things that they may not be comfortable with in terms of technology. Um, but um, I, I'm sorry if that frustrates you or makes you mad, but if you want to keep these people, then you're going to go to them. Yeah, I mean, you know, as anytime you get into these kind of conversations, right? Yeah, you know, we, can, we all feel the same way. We all want to grumble about it and feel grumpy about it. I certainly do. Um, and I can then choose to do something about it or I can choose to, you know, carry it around and just be grumpy about it. So it's, you know, <laughs> I, and if, I, I if like you choose to be grumpy about it then those camp directors who are doing stuff and who are being current and who are retaining their staff they're not going to listen yeah those camp well, directors aren't going to care because they're getting staff and they're getting their staff early and they have great community and they are they're set so um yeah sorry it's hard but you didn't sign up for an easy job well, that's true. And I mean, and Sarah, all of our Kurtz all the time talk, talks about, you know, like she didn't, you know, f fix the plumbing when a bathroom broke at Camp Algonquin because that's not in her skill set, man. You know, she hired somebody to go do that. Right. So if it's not in your skill set, you know, have somebody else do it. Right. <laughs> you know, that, that's just the way to handle it. Uh, so many of these ideas um, uh, sort of work in these, in these big, broad uh, topics or categories. Um, how do we take a look at, sort of refining that down. Is there some strategies in here when it comes to finding, I don't know, program staff or even more specifically nurses or uh, kitchen staff I know sometimes people struggle with or um, male staff, everybody seems to always struggle with just getting men. I mean, how do we sort of start refining these ideas um, and take us to that next level as far as how do we use a marketing approach when we're really looking for X? Right, <laughs> one of the things um, that you just mentioned, Scott, is really, a, a difficult situation, and that is the lack of male staff. I mean, it just, it's, it's universal. You know, it's not just in one region or one type of camp, it's, it's pretty universal. Um, look at your marketing materials for staff. If they show all girls, that suggests. So, so think in terms of what the presentation is, the same way when you do for campers, if you serve multi-ages, you make sure all of those ages and those genders are shown. Yeah. And so be, be intentional. We use that word all the time about our program design, but about staffing being very, very intentional. And I guess to Travis's point, but Travis, maybe you can chime in on this. I mean, understand where they're looking right? Like, yeah, you can make a really great brochure these days, this awesome, fancy color brochure. And I can pretty much guarantee that most people aren't seeing it. Staff are definitely not seeing it. Most parents aren't seeing it. Um, I mean, maybe if you have a building like, uh, like a YMCA, uh, people might see it kind of on the way in or at the front desk. You know, it might be a good opportunity to put something there. But other than that, when are people even looking at that? So I don't know, Travis, do you have any ideas about as far as when we're looking for staff, taking Joanna's idea, how do we make sure that, I mean, what, what do you suggest we update as far as what are they looking at? They're not looking at our Facebook page is what you just told us and you're on mute. Travis, you're on mute. I got it. Yep. I think I'd used Zoom before. Um, <laughs> the, okay, so I, I think we definitely have to go find people where they're at. So if you don't know where that is then you have to research and find that out. Uh, I think it is, um, worth building, <clears throat> pardon me, some sort of referral program from your own staff to get people to come to them. Um, and that again, it involves painting that picture. Here's who we're looking for. Uh, and here's some characteristics and send that out to your staff. If you're looking for people with specific skills, then you have to go to, um, then you have to go to a professional association that you know will be that'll let you know where the schools are that teaches those skills you um you may have to go 
uh, get some face time with those people. It is definitely an under underutilized technique. Uh -oh. Here is. Travis, re-say please what you what yeah, you, you just froze halfway through that. Yeah. So <laughs> the I oh, I'm gonna wait until you nod, Scott, that you can hear me back. Okay, great. Um it is it's underutilized for the camp directors need to get in front of classrooms more. You need uh, to go to colleges who are in those things and say, develop some sort of um, talking point. It's not just, hey, my camp is awesome and you should work here. It doesn't work for campers. It doesn't work for staff either. You're just repeatedly saying you should buy from us or you should work for us. You have to go into a class and prove to that class that you understand what their life is like. Yeah. Like I do a, um, I do a, a class that did last year and we'll see if I do it this year for grad students on building a personal brand. And um, that is all stuff that you less life lessons from camp that can be applied to students um, are many. Everybody knows that, but we should not just keep those to ourselves. We mm -hmm. should be out in front of classrooms and saying, here's some things. Can I guest lecture? Can I, have you got a panel on a topic I can speak on? Is there a, um, you know, association of students in HR who, that we can come and speak to your club? All of those things. Instead of just, being in a giant gym or in a hallway to college, um, along with other recruiters, do sure. the thing that makes you real and personal and stand out to them. Yeah. And build yeah. a relationship with those individuals, right? And that back to what you were saying in the very beginning. I think this is like a question, right? Like a lot of times we just say college students, but that means like everyone in this maybe age group, but like how do we <laughs> narrow it in and the particular clubs or the particular majors or the particular classes that feed to camp and um, do much targeted marketing toward our, our target audience. Uh, Joanna, I know you got something to say. One of the ways that we do this at Camp Taltry is we don't find the classes, we find the professor, right? We get some professor who's, who's all into, we, we work with kids with autism, so all into autism or all into whatever, and then they, they're the ones that then facilitate all the work that that I, I can't say I do it all. Our camp directors do it. Kristen uh, McMaster, who's maybe even watching, she's the one that does all that work. So, but the point is, is that when you get those professors, that's when a lot of it starts to move. Joanna, what were you gonna say? Well, I bet everybody on this phone call, when you said colleges and university, kind of nodded their heads and said, we do that, and then turned off the rest of it. You're not working your connections at the colleges and universities. If you've got two, three, one superstar counselor who happens to go to Bowdoin, you've got an in at Bowdoin. And what you've got to do is arm that person with incentives, okay, but with the tools, who can sell better to another counselor possibility than someone who's already, who talks their language, who knows, who knows who they are, what they're all about. So if you can really get into the school or the university, it, it's to your advantage. And just take one or two for this year, and maybe next year you could add another, but make it in a manageable segment. Yeah. Don't just say, oh yeah, we already do that. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. gotta really focus on doing it well. Doing it well. I, I see Howie up here said uh, that, you know, your, your current staff are your best ambassadors, right? I mean, they got a million friends, but they also know how hard it is to work at camp. So they're only going to tell like the three or four that they think are actually going to be able to do it because they don't want their knucklehead friends to come because that's going to be, that's like, it's hard for them at work, right? Like it's hard for them at camp. They don't want that. So, you know. That's, well, that, that sounds like a pretty good way to get to the right people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they're if they're, they're only going to recommend those people they know can put up with the hard work, and I don't care that they share the good stuff and the bad stuff. It's a realistic picture, and then you don't have people quitting in the middle of the summer, you know, for no reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, it kind of. Well, there's always a little pressure. I don't know. Probably everybody on this call has done it this before, but uh, you know, there's a little bit of pressure when you bring one of your friends to camp. Right, because you kind of feel a little responsible uh, for like how they do, which I know is, is you know, it's like a bit of a stretch, but I, I remember having that kind of stress, you know, like it's, it's somehow showing on me. Um, you know, Travis, one of the things I wanted to circle back to um, is this idea of a benefits package. 
right? We can't offer them a lot of money as to the point that a lot of people are making. Sometimes it's no money at all. Um, what's so, tell us more about that. Give us some real concrete ideas around like, what do I put in this benefits package? I don't want to just flower it up and make it flowery and be like, you're going to be, you're great at talking to people and listening to kids <laughs> at the end of the summer. I mean, I don't know. What, what would you tell us? Uh, well, I would say, first of all, go look at the project real job work that the ACA and Kim Acock did. It's, it, it lays it all out for you. It makes, it gives you the whole thing um, that allows people to see what's in it for them. And um, so, it, you know, it's a lot of the life skill stuff all laid out. Um, but I would also say that in terms of marketing and communications, we, we've got to tell stories. Like we're gonna come back to the basics of, of communication. In recruiting these people, you gotta they gotta see themselves in the stories that you tell. And so um, I I think in all marketing, storytelling is king. And we have to train, it has to become a culture of storytelling at our camp. Like I think we have to practice that art. Um, and we have to give staff even the, what's the thing where you, um, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue, the um, the little game or booklets that you buy, you fill in a blank word. Mad Libs. Yeah, Mad Libs. Yeah, so if you're giving staff the Mad Libs version of, of a camp story, uh, then, they are touching all the high points or you're giving them the framework really to tell their own camp stories and then use technology to capture that get you know have them work on the instagram um, post for that have them work on the videos that you can send out that they can send out etc like use all the tools that are available to you at this point i i remember i think i saw this recently even maybe travis on your facebook how you have talked several times about that camp counselor who told you that you would make a great camp counselor, right? And how that changed the trajectory of your life. And so can we train our staff to tell stories about the gratification of being a camp counselor to campers? Um, and how will that kind of help with our acquisition um, in three, four, five, ten years? Um, yeah. hey, Sarah, one of the questions I, I actually wanted to ask you um, about this is that because it's a business school idea, I think, um, we talk a lot about when we're putting together business plans about value propositions. And I was wondering, could we, is it appropriate to use that same idea to talk about like an employee value proposition? Like how would we, you can tell everybody what the three things are, but how would we use that idea as far as what we're talking about here to really sort of sell it? Okay, I'm going to be completely honest and say I'm not entirely sure what you mean, but I'm going to interpret it. But you could clarify a little bit for me. Do you remember the three? It's like quantified value, unique differentiation, and specific benefit. That's what it is. So the idea is like, well, how do we then take, you know, this idea called camp, right, and do those three things with an employer or a potential employee, right? What's the specific benefit, which is what we're talking right. about here. right. right? What's the yeah. unique differentiation? Why work for me versus anybody else this summer? Right. And, and whatever the other one is that I said. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think this goes back to like actually making a marketing plan for it, right? Um, and so I think um, a lot of times there's like, oh no, I have to recruit staff. I'm gonna like, oh, I'm gonna go to all these fairs and I'm gonna print up all this, all these giveaways and like we just panic, right? But there's no strategy behind it. So thinking about we are investing time and money in recruiting staff. Um, we do make a plan, but it's not, it's often on the fly. And so how do we use something like that framework, like a value proposition framework to really figure out how we're going to do it for this year and invest dollars in it because our return on investment for dollars in staff recruitment is huge. Even though it's hard to quantify, it leads to things like camper experience, camper retention, parent satisfaction, um, like lack of um, money that you spend on emergencies, on problems. Like, you know, there are some things that you can quantify um, and track over time. So um, I think finding a framework like that and creating a plan from it is super valuable. Um, so we're not just like beating the same drum every year and wondering. Yeah. And, and I think, Sarah, you're absolutely right. 
um, the game plan, like what we do in Marketing Mondays, Travis, you know, month by month by month, you know, how are you going to do it to the five networks, new acquisition and retention and the people who are coming next year. That same, that same thoughtful, intentional strategy has to be in place right beside it for recruiting staff, because that's the only way that you'll get into the routine of it, the rhythm of it, and be able to manage it. Okay, Joanna, give us some advice then right now. It's December 10th. I'm feeling really behind already because of everything y'all just said to me about networking and I haven't done it. And oh my gosh, it's almost the holidays and everyone's going to fall off the planet here in a minute. So what do I do in the next like couple of weeks to get all this going? Give me some okay. really on the ground practical. Before questions. anybody gets any vacation time, these are the things you must do. Okay. You haven't already invited your superstars back. Get to them. If you can't, it can't give them a contract right now, and I've got clients who, that, that's their situation, um, then still get to them, call them, write them, tell them you want them back, hope that they've made plans for the summer, give them the dates of the summer, including the staff training time, Be, do it now. The second thing is what we talked about early on in the conversation, is get to all of your networks, and say to them, you know, each with a different context. You're gonna to talk to a donor a little bit differently than you're gonna to talk to a, a parent alumni or a camper alumni, and say to them, you must know a young man or a young woman who wants to influence kids positively. Mm -hmm. Send them to us and do that before the holiday. So I shouldn't wait and do all the things Travis just told me to do as far as make everything pretty and make it all, just call them right now, you're telling me. Call them right now. After this well, webinar, I'm going to hang well, up with you all and call them. Well, yeah, if you haven't been in touch with your staff, you've started to lose that emotional connection time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would. that would be a priority. And yeah, I want the pretty flyer, Uncle Sam wants you kind of thing to be done. So it's very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, but but it's more important that you do it. You send out a email, whatever communication you know they will hear you on mm -hmm. and get to everybody. And then the third thing that I would say is activate your, incentivize and activate those superstars who are on staff with you, who are in colleges and 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 empower them to go recruit staff for you. Give them posters, give them flyers, give them whatever they need, give them a budget so they can throw a pizza party to bring people into their room and talk about camp and show a video slideshow. Why not? Yeah, you just said Jack's magic word. That's his whole recruiting strategy is pizza. So that's all he does. <laughs> Absolutely. Travis, what about you? Give us like the push out the door right now. What are the two or three things you want us all to do today before we leave the office or if, if we haven't done any of this stuff? Yes, great. Um, I was just putting in the chat just one thing. Uh, people are sharing some great ideas just with us, and I want you to share with all panelists and all attendees so that, wow. that everybody can see it. So um, just gold going by there. Make sure it's going to everybody so that we can all see what's going on. Gosh, I wish I could pay attention over there. I'm just looking at your guys' beautiful faces. Sorry. I'll read it later. I'll read the transcripts. Uh, my, my do right now is, um, there's a couple of simple things, uh, but te technical things. I would say the absolute do right now is check your website and make sure it's set up for easy to find staff. There are two problems that I see repeated on almost every camp website. One is that across the top of the, 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 you know, the top navigation bar of a website, they have a button called staff. And every time a parent sees that, they think, oh, this is the camp trying to tell me about their great staff, about their training, you know, who they hire and how particular they are. But most camps are using that as this is our recruitment place. Mm -hmm. So you need to keep a button called staff and tailor it towards um, parents. And then the next thing I encourage camps to do is to have a button somewhere called summer job. Don't make it fancy. Don't, you know, don't make it, um, you know, the summer of your dreams. Just make it summer job. Because in terms of search engine placement, people are going to be looking 
who aren't connected to your network, people are just coming in from the cold to you, or who have heard great things about Stomping Ground uh, or Tall Tree and I want to know how to work there, they're just going to work in, put in summer camp job at Tall Tree and, or summer job at Tall Tree. They're not going to say, where do I find the job of my dreams in a search engine? <laughs> So make sure that you're set up for search engines. that you have a button there that says summer job and that's your recruiting place. And so that's a simple, that's a go-to, that's, a, that's a, a five minute job if you can make your own website changes, that's a 15 minute job if you have to tell somebody how to do it. Um, and but then check that they simple. did it correctly and then check to make sure yeah, they did Follow up your, with yes. your website people. Thank you. Um, I would say a little more, just keeping on a technical theme, it's not a do it today thing, but it's something that I would encourage camps to look at for the next little while, is we talked before the recording about um, having a chat box on your website. And most of those chat companies now have um, some simple automation built into those chats. So if you're not actively there, if you don't have a staff member monitoring the chat, uh, you can put in, for, you know, put in that chat our staff's not here right now, but maybe I can point you some in the right direction to answer your questions and make sure that there's summer job in there so that you can send people like, you know, some student is coming home from studying at one o'clock and they're just mad and sick and tired of the cold in whatever town they're at college and they're just thinking about summer and, and you want them to be able to find information quickly. So, um, so make sure that th that's something that you, I think you can use. I would say that the, the other, Part of this it's super basic website stuff that you should have said is you should have a search button easily available in the top navigation of your camp website it is missing on most of them and it drives me flipping crazy but <laughs> but your main market your main job of your front page of your website is not to recruit staff and so make it easy for those people to find out where the staff recruitment stuff is where the details are where the here's what you're going to get out of this job is um and probably that's just by having a search thing too so right. those are some uh, three technical things that i would make sure that well, your website is set up for this recruiting but system. then i assume every place you're going to find people to your earlier point you're pointing them kind of all back to someplace central like your website, I would assume what you're talking about is where you want them to go, right? Like, hey, if you're interested, here's where you're gonna find out that information. I mean, we try to take it at the next level and find out if somebody's interested, we try to get their information and we try to make the first um, reach outwards. But if we're just sort of marketing, putting it out there, I would assume you want us to point everything back to the place that you're talking about, Travis. Cool. Yep. Yep. Sarah, what's going on in the chat? Is there anything we should be talking about or any questions that come up came up? Um and I mean just lots of lots of great nuggets in there. I mean, I think Scotty and Alice are talking about bringing back former staff for all or partial summer and, and being willing to maybe have an untraditional schedule for them. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is an interesting segue to another question I had for Joanna and Travis, which is, um, if we're thinking about this from a marketing lens product or what we're selling is something we need to examine, right? So we can do all the promotion we want, but if the product isn't a match, no one's going to buy it. Right. Um, so our product in this case is our experience of working or volunteering at camp. And so I'm wondering, are there things about that experience, AKA that product that you think are outdated or unattractive or obsolete that are in our power to change that we might want to consider um, so that we're selling something that's attractive to people. And one example is a lot of camps say no vacation time at all over the summer. And I think many applicants don't like that inability to be flexible. So um, what are some, what are, what's your take on that? What are some other examples of things that maybe we should consider changing about what we're trying to sell? Well, I, I think the new model is different. I mean, intergenerational counselors, <laughs> why not? Uh, Part-time counselors, as long as they have some experience and you can train them to today's product. I mean, that's, that's enormously important. And um, there's one other thing I'd like to add, and that is getting staff input. Um, the staff want to be mentored. They want to know how you want things done. But they also, amazingly enough, after a week of orientation and two weeks of camp, a number of my camps have done snap polls with staff and asking them to make a recommendation of what could make the experience better for kids. These counselors are geniuses. 
I mean, they, they really, they see things with such different eyes and the perspective really helps the process. And when you ask staff to give their input, you show you value them and it deepens the relationship. So I think, and the retention rate that we were talking about earlier. Um, so I think the, um, it, there's there's no there's no right way to do it anymore. It's you're going to have to be creative. Well, and to your point, I, I've talked to two different camp directors over the course of the last couple of months that said they were both new to their programs, uh, and they at the beginning they were having a very hard time. No matter how much how much they ask for feedback and for input, they were having a very hard time getting it. And then as soon as they sent out a, a group text to everybody that was like, "Hey, what's the story?" people right. can respond and then you know how you can like like messages and on and on and on and all of a sudden both of these camp directors got all kinds of feedback and it was just about how it wasn't the fact that they weren't asking it was just about how they were asking right. and next thing you know they were getting some of that of course the next important piece is then do something with the with the input with the feedback right. um you know that we want to see action even if it's you know we've had some different ideas about opening day we're going to stick with it this time here's why whatever the case may be but we, you know we have there has to be some sort of action mm -hmm. um Travis, what about you uh as far as what, what sarah was asking I didn't really plan to come in into this and be tough love, Travis, but um, apparently <laughs> that's my focus for today. Um, I, I think you it. have to be way more flexible than you want to be. Uh, yeah. I think that um, that it, you would you do your campers and staff a service if you do hire intergenerational people. I have seen and worked with camps who prioritize getting staff to come back with their families and work for the summer, giving teachers jobs for parts of the summer, getting alumni back for two or three weeks. All of that is good long-term culture building things. And it's, yes, you're not, it's not the same as hiring, whatever your number is, hiring 50 staff who are in college that you can give straight 10 straight days of training and they'll be fully bought in and in the mindset on opening day. It's different now. We have lots of tools to make that easier, but um, but I think we have to be an extra blend of, of flexible because uh, just so that we get the right people for our kids, that when we get enough of them and we get a good variety and the ones who are there aren't burned out and we're not asking too much of them. And that means a level of flexibility that is unprecedented in the camp industry in the 100 plus years it's been around. Well, Travis, I think, I think on top of that, because I'm happy to be pretty much as flexible as possible. I learned that from Scotty Jackson, who's like, rules are dumb. We'll just figure it out. Um, thanks, Scotty. Working for you is great. Um, but I think that one of the things that I see with our staff is that they're afraid to ask for those accommodations because they assume that they're putting us out. And that's back to what you talked about earlier, which is building the individual relationships so they feel comfortable when we talk and changing the medium from which we are talking, whether it's texting or finding polls or those kind of things. Because we, we are about to hire somebody who's going to just not work any of our normal program options that normally all of our counselors do because she's taking three online courses and needs to be able to take them. So she's going to run a village, we call it being a panda, and miss on all the program time. Okay, great. Like then she's going to be at camp and make an impact. Right. But she would never have asked for that. I had to like spend 45 minutes on the phone with her to figure out what the problems were so we could solve them with her. I, I think it's interesting to, to go back to what Travis said about finding the very first thing you said, right. Is you said finding the right people for our kids. I think everybody on this webinar has probably gotten to that sort of, none of us want to admit it, but that kind of warm body moment where we get an applicant Maybe they're even a, a, a man and we're like, sweet, you're hired, you know, and then we maybe run some reference checks or whatever. I mean, you know, because we're, we're so worried about the ratio, right? We got to have a certain number of kids or a certain number of staff because we, we've already taken the money from all these kids um, and here we go. So I, I think it's really back to that. I think we've got to be really thoughtful about that. And if it means I'm going to have somebody here for a couple of weeks uh, as opposed to all six or all eight, Great. That means, you know, we're going to have somebody really solid for those couple of weeks. Um, we don't have a ton of time. We're only about 10 more minutes left. Is there anything, um, Sarah or Kurtz or Jack, that have come up in the um, chat that we, we, we need to get back to? Or, or, um... uh, could I address what you just yeah. said? 
Um, the flexibility is important, um, but with the flexibility, there comes more, more responsibility to be mentoring the staff, especially those who drop in and drop out, uh, and, and to create a culture that when someone asks for an accommodation or you work with them to figure out what the accommodation is, that it, it, it makes sense. You know, other staff members are going to see this person doing the three online staff courses and are gonna realize what this person brings to the Panda section. Um, but if someone is just frivolously, you know, going off for, you know, for drinking sprees or weddings every weekend. So you've got to keep, it, it's an interesting culture and you've got to make sure that you're, you're tending to your culture because the fabric of your community can change if you have a lot of transient people just, you know, dropping in and dropping out and they're not all marching in the same direction. So yes, flexible, but more responsibility in terms of management and more intentionality. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurtz or Jack, was, was there anything that we want to we wanna swing back around to? Uh, I can do that because I'm watching what Mike O'Brien has said in the question and answer box and in the thing. So thanks, Mike, for um, pursuing it. I see Darby's jumping in with some good ideas, but Mike's question was about maintaining the community throughout the year when there's sort of different levels of comfort with technology. Mm. Um, and I think it also kind of ties into what Abigail said about um, how do you manage all of these different needs and different um, capabilities and scheduling all that stuff um, without giving yourself stress. And I think the answer to all of that is systems. If you know who the people are who aren't going to respond to anything from tech, then um, there's no reason. Then those are the people who will likely pick up the phone when you call them, and they'll be the ones who have a positive feeling about your camp when you send them a birthday card and you send them. But you have to know your people. You have to use technology to write down those notes. Like you know, Jack hates it when I call him first without texting and just saying, "Hey, do you have time to chat?" Um, so I, I know that. So I'm going to text Jack and say time today, time right now or time in the next couple hours if we could chat, let me know and I'll give you a call. But if you are knowing your people, this is all back to point one, back to relationships, um, then uh, use the tools that are available to you to help with scheduling, to help with all these personal touches, to know what the things are. That is a great question for an early recruiting. Oh, shoot, I wish I had that with me. I'll I'll find it before we go, but um, an early recurring contact with people, trust building contact with somebody like, you know, what's, what's your reward? You know, in our family, we talk about um, at GoCamp Pro stickers are our love language. Um, so what are the simple rewards that you like? Like, is it chocolate? Do you want, you know, a couple of polished apples snuck to you in your bag when you, you find it? Like, what is those little things that I as a camp director can write down that can be part of what makes um, you know, what makes you happy? What makes you feel connected? Is it one-on-one -on -one time? Do you like to sing in harmonies and groups? Do you want, um, you know, to have someone that you connect with personally? All of those things are accomplishable, not just when you are meeting people um, at camp. So if people aren't, you know, want one-on-one -on -one connections and then, you know, just texting makes them mad, set up a Zoom call and chat with them. But You've got technology that'll make all these systems easier to manage. Well, and then what I hear you is just about being organized, right? It doesn't matter where your system is. You can write it down, you can yep, put it in your calendar, sure. whatever, right? But it's like, as long as you're organized about it, right? Like, I'm not gonna, as Darby well knows, I'm not going to ever just by myself, just, you know, always post to Instagram or whatever. But if we systematize it and I put it in my calendar that I got to do it, or I actually asked Darby to bug me or whatever, then great. And we've developed an organizational system to do it. Uh, but again, back to that idea, if like, if we're going to be reaching out for birthdays, or if we're going to be texting a, a, a cohort, if we're going to maybe stick with Facebook for some of our, our staff, whatever it might be, right? I think, you know, we've got to organize that and then be willing to to, to sort of march through that. Um, Joanna, did you have something you wanted to add at the end of that one? I do, real quick. Um, you know, this uh, learning opportunity is, is tremendous. And the temptation for someone who goes to all of these sessions is going to just, you know, be to be to the point of overwhelm with all these great ideas. Be judicious. What can you do 
and choose the one, two, or three things that you can do and that you can really get the biggest bang for your buck with. And, um, and you know that makes a lot more sense than taking in all these ideas and not getting anything done. So for whatever that's worth, I think, and use your resources. You know, um, Jack's gonna send uh, the link to the article. We've already got a benefits package outlined for you if that's important to you. There are some great quotes. Uh, so take a look at that and all the work that um, they're doing at Real Job at ACA. It's terrific stuff. So use your resources, but focus on one or two or three things and really make them happen. Get good at a few. Worry about the rest later, right? Hey, Ruby, come back and join us. It was great to see your face. We'd love to hear you talk about this for the last couple of minutes that we have. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. We're just wrapping up our conversation about marketing and staff and all this kind of stuff. You give us your one minute or 30 second gem around recruiting staff using, thinking about how we're marketing specifically to either new staff, returning staff, doesn't matter. Oh, gosh. Um, this, this uh, is not what you plan on speaking about. So. Well, Totally on the spot. I will it. say that uh, one thing that comes to mind is looking carefully, maybe this has already been said, but looking carefully at the pictures that are on your website and the materials that are going out and what experience are you representing. I think yeah. that that's what I'm thinking of is something very shallow that one of I, I've asked the question about like getting male staff and how co ed camps will often make sure they have lots of pictures of male staff, you know, intermingled with female staff and whatnot. Um, and then how a, uh, an all boys camp I know in the area is like, we just make sure there's lots of hot girls on our, <laughs> on our well, website. <laughs> it's just like, maybe, maybe, maybe not the best advice, but I just. But we've also heard uh, so far, <laughs> sort of aware of your own organization and understanding your own sort of culture and reaching out into your networks. And so, hey, that might work for um, the camp. Which terrible. Camp it's so about. terrible. Real talk. <laughs> Um, hey, Travis, do you want to give us your last like couple of ideas and then let everyone know where we can find you when we all desperately want a little bit more of either tough love, Travis, or regular old regular love, Travis? <laughs> Ruby, you missed out. <laughs> tough love, Travis, is for real. You got to beware. Oh, yeah, we got a little bit just this, this hour, so. So uh, something Ruby said um, really um, set up, thank you Ruby for that, uh, set up my final point is that in all of your communication, you're communicating values, you're communicating what's important to you, you're communicating, this is how our camp runs, this is how we treat our people, et cetera. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll email this link, but this is a guidebook that Camp Waro in Quebec creates called a pre-interview staff guide. And they have a whole guide that people can download for free, or if there's time, they get mailed. It's, it's created by Waro, so Gabrielle is a, a designer as well as a camp owner. And so it's stunning. Um, but it is all about what the job is. And it's so people who have begun the process, so that you've got them into your fold, they're going to be interviewed, and then they send out this too. And so what an amazing first impression to someone who can have 17, looking at 17 jobs for the summer, but the one that says, here's the whole process, here's all laid out for you, here's what it's gonna be like for you, boom, let us make it easy. Yeah. That's a, such a great thing about your camp culture that it is an amazing, powerful statement from Waro about what it means to work for them. It shows you the level of intention in that. So be intentional. Be intentional. All right, Travis, tell us a little bit where we can find you and get to you after this, after this webinar. Absolutely. Go to gocamp.pro and see all of the stuff that um, we're working on there. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Gocamp.pro. Joanna, do you want to leave us with an idea and tell us where we can find you? I think I know, <laughs> camp-consulting.com. Um, and uh, take, take the gem that resonates with you and make it happen. Make it happen. Give us some, some nice marching orders. Thank you guys very much for joining us. We really appreciate all of your ideas. Sarah or um, Jack, do you guys have any final thoughts or anything else in that chat we should quickly talk about in the one minute we have left here. No, just thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for being here. Thank you for your awesome ideas. Um, and y'all are the best. Um, we really appreciate you coming out and, and making this possible. So. I feel excited that Travis has a new nickname and I feel sad that we didn't make one for Joanna. So um, I'm going to think on that and we'll, we'll get you a hashtag too, Joanna. It's yeah. not. Uh, know, just, yeah. My camp name is Radar. So maybe that. Your camp name's Radar? 
Star, yes. Really? Yes, actually named by three different camps, not knowing the other. It's so awesome. Yeah, I like I'm it. I'm calling you anything else. <laughs> that is amazing, Radar. Um, her uh, uh, Radar's website is up there. Everyone should go sign up right now. Can we get to your hints right on your yes. on front page yes. of website? Yes. So, uh, monthly hints. Monthly hints. Joanna sends out monthly email hints. Go, everybody, sign up for it right now because they're they're pretty awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, Stomping ground. Thanks you. Our whole community. Thanks you for giving us the giving us all these wonderful ideas. We really appreciate it, you guys. Thanks you. Thanks, Scott. Bye bye, guys. Ruby, thanks for coming in early. Kirk came in early too, but uh, then he disappeared. I'm not sure exactly what happened to him. Here. Well, I I I did that to him. Oh, you you kicked him out. Jeez. Demoted him. Well, Good. He asked me to m make him an attendee <laughs> so he didn't have to sit there, like, just trying to, like, look normal the whole time, which you all know. Uh, I would have, you know me, I wouldn't have let, let him look normal. I would have just I him. I would have hated that. Plus, I have a bag of popcorn here I've been trying to eat, but I decided to be unprofessional, unprofessional to do it on the webinar. So I bet Kurt was enjoying his popcorn while I was here sitting looking at mine. There you go. Um, so um, I think... Kurt, if you can hear us, you might have to exit out of Zoom and then log back on. <laughs> He's like, or maybe we can reassign you. So we'll work on. All right. Well, you guys work on all that. I'll, here. I'll start introducing this uh, next hour. Thanks, everybody, for either sticking with us or joining right now. You guys are on the Camp Stomping Ground Benefit webinar. Uh, that I, myself, and Sarah Kurtz McKinnon and Jack Schott organized for Jack's camp. I'm going to toss it over to him in a minute so he can tell you a little bit about camp. My name is Scott Arizala. I'm a summer camp consultant and trainer, um, and I just want to say thank you to all the panelists uh, that have uh, joined us the last couple of days and for the rest of the week, as well as everybody who signed up for this. It's um, amazing to be not only part of this uh, community, but when uh, you sort of see the kind of story that can't, that Stamping Ground has really um, uh, given all of us in our industry, it's pretty amazing to, to look at what they're doing and um, I'm happy and humbled to be a part of it. So Jack, you wanna tell us a little bit about Stamping Ground and why we're all here? Yeah, thanks Scott, That's, uh, that was amazing. And I feel good every time you say nice things to me, so please don't ever stop. Um, uh, your love language. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are in our sixth summer, coming in our sixth summer, and we're uh, acquiring a property right now. We've got, um, actually, my parents and Laura's parents and my brother are at the property right now just doing work in the rain, and there's about a foot of snow while I'm on this webinar with you guys. So I'm like the luckiest guy in the whole world, so really grateful to them. I'm really grateful to um, Ruby and Kurt. And Scott and Kurtz for being on here to share some some awesome stuff. I'm excited to to kind of take notes and and learn here. Kurt, we haven't met yet, which is really fun. Uh, this is my first time meeting Kurt. Kurt's just like, yeah, I'll help out, do whatever. Who's who are these people? So I appreciate that, um, and really appreciate um, all y'all coming in and donating to make this possible. You're going to make it possible for uh, over 100 kids at a time to be at camp this summer, and then to be able to grow um, through that. So really appreciate what you're doing. Um, to what we call inspire the next generation of radically empathetic decision makers, which is a bunch of buzzwords for let a bunch of kids play in the woods uh, more, than, more than they normally do. So uh, I'm going to shut up and let you guys, uh, let you all be um, smarter than me. So thank you all so much. And Kurtz, go ahead. You look at how excited you are. No, yeah, yeah, Kurtz has got something. I have lots of things to say, but the biggest mystery is how Ruby and Kurt know. I, we should just call me Sarah because Kurtz and Kurt is tremendously yeah, it's gonna, confusing. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Um, but my question is, how do Kurt and Ruby know each other and why do they know so many dad jokes? Who wants to go first? Kurt, you're muted, so you better unmute yourself there. <laughs> it's Twitter is what it is. No, so <laughs> Kurt taught my standards instructor class uh, a couple years ago now and uh, he started off with dad jokes and I was like, all right, it's on. I, we'll just play this game. So yeah, it's been ongoing for a couple of years now. So you're ACA buddies. <laughs> I'm going to tweet the story just a little bit because we had done some dad joke tweeting and two days before the uh, session, Ruby tweeted a dad joke to me and said, I guess we're going to have dad jokes the whole weekend. And we did. 
best. It was excellent. It was excellent. It was excellent. Great. Excellent. You guys want to take an opportunity, Ruby? Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, why you decided to join us. For sure. So uh, my name is Ruby Compton. I live in Western North Carolina, just south of Asheville. Um, I am the Chief Exploration Officer for Ruby Outdoors, which just is a fancy way to say I'm self-employed. Uh, but I'm essentially a freelance camp director now. Uh, so I help out wherever needed. Um, they're fortunate there's about 60 camps within a two-hour radius of where I live. So I kind of bounce around between camps during the summer. And then in the off-season, do a little bit of everything. Um, also work part-time with Go Camp Pro, helping with master classes there. So just really themes of learning and supporting the camp industry because camp people have hard jobs and so they need some people who get it supporting them. So that's what I do. Excellent. Why, why did you say yes to me when I, <laughs> when I asked you to come do this? Um, it is a great way to connect with some phenomenal people. Um, and not only did it come from Scott, but the ask also came via Travis. So I had like double pressure, I think, to say yes. <laughs> but this, these are amazing people who've given a lot to the camping industry. So an hour of my time is, is a very small contribution to give back. Well, thank you. We, we really appreciate that, Ruby. Kurt, tell us a little bit about you. What do you do? I am the camp director at Camp For All, which is a camp for children and adults with special needs and challenging illnesses in Texas. And I tell you what, for, I don't know where everybody is, but it's really cold down here. We got down like 45 today, so <laughs> kind of craziness, yeah. So, no, and, uh, crazy, I, so I, yeah. I also do training and consulting with Journey Consulting, which is really just another way to say Kurt, and uh, I'll do some camp training stuff, conferences, and I work with uh, small businesses and organizations. So, and I haven't had a chance to meet, but I'm gonna tell you kind of the same thing that Ruby said. Um, I think the reason we're here is because people asked us, and if you've got a friend like Scott, um, that's, a, that's a good friend to have when he says, hey, come help out. So I, I will say that I said yes, and then I went on the website and looked at what I was uh, donating my time to, but first I just said yes to Scott. Well, again, thank you. That means so much to me that both of you would join us and actually that you guys would be willing to talk about uh, uh, an idea uh, uh, that's so close to my heart as far as what I do. But just we wanted to really spend an hour talking about access. Um, how do we help sort of open the doors to what it is that we're doing in the, in the sort of summer camp field? Um, uh, Ruby, tell us a little bit about when, when you, when we emailed you the topic, what was the sort of first few things that came through your mind? I mean, how do you even want to frame this conversation? Oh, golly. It's a big one, huh? Um, I, one of the things that's interesting is I have found myself in a place where people are coming to me and directors that I really respect are coming to me saying, how do I talk about insert controversial topic here uh, at camp? And I did not set out on my camp support journey to be that person. Um, so I feel like I've had to like quickly become a social justice warrior and learn how to have some of these conversations and have found myself with some tools, but also lots of questions. <laughs> I think that that's, I think that it's okay to approach this kind of conversation knowing that you may have your eyes open to some things, but also you may walk away with more questions and that's okay, There's, there, that is valuable too. So um, I, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is like, don't be afraid of the questions that may come up for yourself and don't be afraid of not knowing all the answers because I certainly don't, but I'm happy to engage in discussion and that's where we learn the most from it. Absolutely, absolutely. Kurt, I mean, this is your whole life. This is the, the camp that you run. I mean, your camp is actually called Camp For All, right? So uh, tell, us, tell us when, you, when we emailed you the topic, like what, how do you see this as somebody who's, who does it every day, who's in this part of the industry? Well, one of the things that we talk about here is we talk about how we're barrier free. And so for us, that, that, that step beyond accessible. And so when you think about accessible or you think about barrier free, I think you think about facilities and activities and how to get somebody in a wheelchair up to the high ropes course. And those are all good things to be thinking about. Um, I guess for me, the beyond the barrier piece though is, is way beyond that about um, how do we deal with the barriers of people who have special diets and the barriers of people who think differently and, and the barriers of, of parents who don't think the camp is right for their kid for whatever reason. And so I'd like us to think of barriers as a, as a larger topic. 
And of course, we need to get to the nitty gritty. People have questions and they're here for a reason. So I want to answer those questions too. But I really, for me, it's really about how we think about something. Yeah. So what are those, what, Kurt, what are the biggest barriers? I mean, you just mentioned three right there, right? Parents inhibitions, uh, you know, meals and, and eating, which, you know, for me and my camp, you know, that's like one of the biggest issues. Um, and then no, I can't remember the other, the third thing you said, uh, but what are those biggest barriers? What are the biggest ones that you see? I think, I think the first thing that we need to think about, the first thing we need to think about is what is our goal? What is our mission and what are we trying to achieve? And I, and sometimes we talk about what we can or cannot do without tying it to what our mission is, what it is we're, we're, we're trying to accomplish. And so let's think of the bigger goal. So when somebody asks for, you know, they say my child doesn't eat green food, anything that's the color green. And our answer is, well, we don't do special diets. We, you know, everybody has to try a bite. We do a thank you bite. And that's the tradition of our camp. Um, my question is, is eating green food a part of the goal and mission of your camp? Mm -hmm. and, and if it's not, then let's talk about what the goal and mission is and, and, and how, do we, how do we break outside some of those things that A, we think is silly. Um, not eating green food might be a silly thing, but there are also lots of kids with sensory issues that green is more than they don't eat vegetables. And so I think it's, I, I think it's taking that step back and trying to find a way to say yes first. Also, I just want to preface, one of my friends does this a lot in camping, and, and I think it's a good thing for us to remember that I believe that there is a camp for everybody. I believe there's a, a camp for every camper. I believe there's a camp for every staff member. But I don't believe that every camp is for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so, so while I think we should be accommodating and do the barrier-free things, we also, that's why I say look at the goal. We also need, to make, need well, to make sure that what we're doing, that we are the right place for this person. Well, I think you bring up a great point because if we are going to go back to our mission, there are so many of us that have these like crazy broad mission statements that if you really take them apart is basically saying, oh, we, it, we're including everybody, yeah. right? And, and that, that's fine if you have the, then the training and, the, rate and the, uh, the amount of supervision and whatever that you can actually include everybody, but that's just not the case. Uh, or actually, Ruby, how do you help? How do you help a camp decide? I mean, Kurt was very clear right here when he just said, we're not, your camp isn't necessarily for everybody. And mm -hmm. I really want camp directors to understand that. You're in the business of giving camp directors advice. So give us all advice on how, how do we do that? Because I want their money and I want heads and beds. And my mission tells me I got to include everybody. Um, yeah. And uh, it's actually, I think, really complicated <laughs> as much as we want to make it super duper simple. But it is because um, I so I want to echo Kurt, Kurt's sentiment about uh, I used to say all the time that I think this is a made up statistic, but I think about 80 percent of kids can go to any camp and be fine. And there's probably 20% of kids that your camp serves particularly well. And so knowing what that audience is, that's important. All right. So if there are people that you are making decisions, uh, yeah, thanks, Kurt, for pointing out made up statistic, definitely 100% anecdotal only. Um, but I think if there are people you are not serving, one, ask the question, is there a place you can refer them to? Uh -huh. Because I think if we are not serving populations, and there's nowhere to send them, then that's not good enough. We have to do better. Um, and I think being really open and honest about what are the limitations that you have, but also not having limitations because you're fearful of taking the step to serve that population. Um, and, and, and I think like I was thinking about as I was looking over some of the questions for today, it's like, if you're an all boys camp and you say you don't serve girls, like that's generally accepted, but if I'm a camp and I say I just serve white people, like that's not okay, <laughs> right? And so there's some, there's some scary lines that we need to be paying close attention to when we are making statements about who we exclude and who we include. And can we all respect that those lines are shifting? The lines are- Yeah, moving. oh yeah. It's, it's hard to figure that out uh, uh, sometimes. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought where I was going to go with that, but, but I am interested in the first thing that you said about um, referrals, right? So I feel pretty good about that, but I work with a bunch of camps. So if like somebody asks me, oh, 
what camp I'm going to like name the people that I know and trust and would send my own kids to. Right. So if I'm a, just a regular old camp decorator, even in a place like Western North Carolina, where there's a bazillion camps, you drive 10 miles past hundred camps. Um, I, how do I do that? I mean, other than maybe trying to network some, with some people, how do I know that I'm going to send them down on the street and that's actually a good camp versus some other camp or whatever. Give us yeah, some advice on that referral situation. Uh, networking, 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 uh, can't say that word enough. Um, you know, Google, like open up a Google search and say, uh, camp for whatever this person is bringing to you that you're like, I don't think I serve that. Google that and somebody has gotten smart and, you know, put some, some, uh, SEO into being the top Google search and then get on the phone with those folks. I think there is no one who is more critical of a camp website or a, a phone conversation with a camp director than another camp director. So I think you can tell a lot as a camp director if you pull up their website or make a phone call and to say, hey, you know, and you don't even have to tell them. You can be sneaky and be like, hey, I have this parent who I'm working with. I'd love to get them connected to you all. Um, or you can just be like, hey, I'm a camp and I'm trying to get some information. Yeah. I go either route, but um, I think start making those phone calls. Go to conference sessions that don't necessarily apply to your camp specifically. Um, if you know, if you do not serve specifically kids who have ADHD, go to the session at the conference that says this is, or the kindred meeting, or whatever it is. Um, it'll it will be worth your hour because you will learn some things. Uh, whether it's stuff you're going to implement at your camp or if it's tips and tricks and tools that you can use when talking with families who are coming to you with needs that you don't feel like you can serve. Excellent. Well, oh, oh, go ahead, Kirk. Well, I was going to kind of pivot a little bit, so you should finish your thought. Well, well I was going to say, just tying off of what Ruby said, one of the things we have schools that serve people with uh, learning differences and special needs that come, they're, they're one of our partners. And getting into those schools and seeing how they teach, um, it, one of the things that I said one time is I wish there was a school like that for my kids to go to and they're typically developing kids. Because the techniques that they're using are applicable for everybody. And so just tying off of what Ruby's saying, uh, to go to those sessions and reach out to those people, I, I really am a strong believer before you refer them to another camp. So before you say, hey, Kurt, can you take this child? They applied to my camp send me an email and say, hey, Kurt, is there a way for me to take this child? Mm. And, and, and let's do that step first. That's why I put the caveat, not every camp is for every child, but let's not start with that. Let's start with what can we do to make our organization barrier free? And I, I'm very connected into the special needs camp community. And I will tell you that I haven't met anybody who wouldn't respond to that email and give you all kinds of advice and, and suggestions and talk through the process. But also, they don't know all the answers because each child is an individual. And so part of this is a process. And that's why kind of doing what Ruby said, working on those things. If this is something you're interested in, you're on this, this webinar, um, prior to the ACA National Conference, there's a special need kindred group for camps that get together. Everybody would be welcome to come to that. And so I think meeting with them, they're meeting somewhere in San Diego. And if, if somebody here knows that, go ahead and put it up. It, otherwise, we can get it uh, to you. But uh, but that's a way to get yourself knowledgeable about the things that you may need to deal with down the road if you're not already. Yeah, I mean, certainly I think everyone's dealing with it. Kurt, or Sarah, I'm sorry, we're going to transition to calling your holy stuff. <laughs> I have too Sarah, many you names. Have you to, to add yeah, I mean, I guess building on what Kurt is saying um, really nicely is um, I sucked at this when I was running a typical YMCA camp. I didn't think about it. Um, anything that I did um, accessibility wise was totally reactive. It was very far down my priority list. And I feel like pretty bad about that. Like that was wrong. And I think there's lots of other camp directors that are in the same position because we do, um, we are pressed for so many different things. And I would say, oh, you know, camp is for everybody. But that's not true. If someone called with a certain limitation, I would have had to say no right away. So I think in retrospect, I could have done a lot better. And I think we could do a lot better as an industry of not just thinking one summer ahead oh, if someone calls and registers and has X, Y, or Z need. Um, can I make something work or can I um, piecemeal something together to make it work? Like that was my plan. I was like, oh, well, we'll get, we'll get a golf cart and we'll get, you know, like, the, no, that's not a plan. That's like a, a band-aid and emergency yeah. situation. So, um, 
you know, I guess I just wanted to kind of channel my inner tough love Travis and say, um, why do we want to make this a priority? Like, how do we make it a priority? Why is my anecdotal observation that it isn't a priority? Um, and our go-to is say, well, there's a camp for someone with that. There's a camp for someone with that, right? And that's where I've been coming from for a long time, but I don't think that's exactly right. And I knew I wasn't ready to like mainstream anybody who just called right into what we were doing. So I'm yeah. curious what Kurt and Ruby um, think about that true confession. <laughs> so the, I, I, think, I think it's because people operate in a lane. And one of the things, actually, I was thinking about this when y'all were talking about marketing and recruitment in the last session. And, you know, there, when we think about marketing and recruitment, we think about, okay, this is what a staff member does. This is how it happens. This is when they get recruited. This is when they start. This is what training looks like. Our organization, everybody does it this way. And, and I will tell you that Camp for All has been in that. We've, we've said, this is who we are for a long time. And we've done that because we've never had problems getting any staff. As soon as we started having problems getting staff with the recruitment that everybody else is having, we, we were like, okay, what else can we do? How do we make it different? And so I think with the recruitment piece, sometimes we think people have to jump through the hoops. They have to do what I did to get to where I am. And, and you know, they haven't paid their dues or whatever that, whatever that looks like. So if you shift that, Sarah, to, to your, the comment about the why, I think it's because people think inside the box of this is how we do camp. And there was a, a, a very, a very good discussion on camp pros. And I don't remember how long ago it was. And I, I'm, I'm an observer most of the time, but I, but I, I jumped in just to, because I found it interesting because people were talking about special diets and it started to go down the avenue of, well, if you create a special meal for this child, then <laughs> if you create a special meal for this child, then another child, you know, then everybody's going to want to ask for that special meal. And so my, my initial response is okay. Right. The, the, the follow up is maybe your kitchen supervisor needs to change the menu. Yeah. What's <laughs> wrong with the meal that everyone wants a special one, right? Right. Exactly. Let, let's do that. There are lots of ways. There are lots of ways to look at it. And, and then finally, one of the comments that I said was, is your camp completely full? Because if you start accommodating special diets for a parent, parents are going to talk and you're going to get more campers with special diets. And while one mind thought is now I have all these special diets, the other is now I have all these campers. And so I think, I think that's why it goes back to the goals. What are we, what are we trying to achieve? But let's get outside of the box of what, of what camp looks like in general, but then what our camp looks like. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the best things that we've done, um, my, uh, our president and CEO started a couple years ago, I did, and she'd had a lot of experience with camps, including being a camper and being at this camp, but she hadn't been involved in camps nationally. And she's an amazing leader. So the very, one of the very first things she said, go visit more camps. I haven't visited them. And so every year we go, not every year, I would like to, every year it's a plan, but lots of years we go and visit camps while they're in operation, not the ACA visit thing. We just and say, show us around, show off, tell us what, what you're doing. And it helps us think about what we're doing in a different way. Sometimes we walk away from those camps and say, wow, that's a really cool thing they do. We will never do that. It doesn't fit who we are. And sometimes we walk around and say, we walk out and say, hey, that's this cool thing they were doing. We never thought about doing it that way. I wonder how we can make it work for us. And I think it, that helps us break out of that, that mindset of there's only a certain ways to do this. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is interesting that I, I don't know who is on the webinar as far as the camps that they're coming from, uh, but I'm guessing that a lot of camps on here are, are fairly typical camps. They serve fairly typical populations. Um, one of the questions that I wanted both of you guys to respond to is just how do you deal with the uh, help us with triage, right? We've all been in the situation where we read the health form, everything looks fine, the kid shows up, everything is clearly not fine, and we got to like figure it out in the first couple of days, if not the first couple of hours. Um, I, I, I just want you guys to sort of chime in about that. I know we want to talk a lot about the institutional stuff that we can change. And here we are in December. We got a pretty big, long runway to get there. But tell us, give us just some advice around, okay, so you're in that moment. It's opening day. You're realizing that it's not all good. How do we sort of 
find figure out what those accommodations might be and then how do we try to plug some of the holes that we might be seeing right away with our staff or the, the kids in those groups so I, I have a question that I would encourage you to ask if you do get the camper family that calls ahead of time, but I think it can also work in this situation when you make that initial phone call or grab the parent before they walk out the door, um, which is tell me about what kind of camp experiencing you're, hope, you're hoping your child will have, right? Mm -hmm. And so if that's a pre-conversation, then they may tell you like, I want my child to have a normal camp experience like every other kid has, right? And if a parent says that to me, I'm probably gonna be a lot less likely to be like, let me hand you off to this camp down the road. I'm a lot more likely to be like, all right, let me see what I can figure out. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a, a smart baseline to, to do. Um, if that parent is walking out of the, the door and you are already seeing like, holy smokes, there's stuff going on here that, uh, we didn't know was going on. I think I would still lead with that question. Like, hey, I just wanted to, before you head out, tell me a little bit more about what you're hoping for your child. Um, and depending on their answer, there may be an entree point to saying, I'm concerned about us being able to deliver that right now. So tell me more about how we can serve the, the needs best. Like, I'm not seeing enough here on the health form based on what I've seen in the first 10 minutes of this child being at camp. Mm -hmm. um, I always working the angle of partnership with parent and saying we've tried this this hasn't seemed to work what do you do at home to make sure that they eat you know dinner because all they're eating is cheese and croutons like is that normal for them <laughs> right asking questions like that um <laughs> well, got all the cheese and croutons they can, they can eat but yeah uh, let's just pause and say that is kind of normal like every summer there is a kid yeah. that's only the cheese and croutons kid yeah uh, and the pepperoni Maybe. put out the little pepperoni <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> Yeah, maybe not as weird as we think. <laughs> yeah, definitely not weird. Uh, no, I appreciate that framework because the framework is about success, mm -hmm. right? And that's how we're framing it. We're not like, ah, oh, we're seeing all these behaviors. This isn't cool. It's how how do we help you know your kid be successful in this in this space? Kurt, tell us what would you say uh, in that moment of like, uh oh, here, here it's coming. What do we do now? Well, so one of the things uh, I like the phrase that you use, Scott, is the triage. Um, and I think, I think it's good for us to think of the triage. So um, it's opening day at camp. Somebody arrived that has um, some concerns that, we're, that we have concerns about that we weren't prepared for. Mm -hmm. So first we need to triage. Um, and, and I think I would triage in a couple of ways. One is triage by day. So right now I want to know what the rest of the day is going to look like and how, how I'm going to make sure that they, we knock the ball out of the park today. Um, the, uh, so that's the, the day's triage. And then it's going to be the kind of the, the triage of concerns with safety being at the top. Mm -hmm. So part of this is going to have to do with how prepared your camp is. And, and, and I don't mean prepared in a general way, but I mean very specifically. Being prepared for a camper with a uh, physical disability is different than being prepared for who um, has intellectual differences, which it could also be on a range of campers who have behavior and act out issues. And so now we're talking about safety for that camper and safety for other campers. And so, so part of it has to do with how prepared. I think it starts with, you know, Ruby talked about that with the question and Brian on the chat also talked about um, really talking to the parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what? Do, let's find out. I love the question about, tell me about what kind of camp experience you want that, that gives you that that point because I think like most of us most of us want the parents to have this expectation and then they want we want their that to be the goal right we achieve way above what their expectations are and so setting the expectation is a point so I'm going to talk about what is it that we need to do right now are there other staff involved for some camps that might mean okay if we have to take a higher ratio of staff does that mean that, that I have to talk to the parents about a different price structure um, is this the first time they've come? Do I have it in the budget that I don't have to talk to them about a different price structure? Instead, we're going to not have a park for this camper because that's what we want to do. And then after camp, I can talk to parents about how well this would look next time. So we give it, you know, that, that piece, they paid just like everybody else, but actually we needed a lot more staff to help make this happen. And we had to buy a things and this is what, the, this is what we needed to do. And then I would look at the activities. Well, what's the plan for the first day? So let's sit down with staff. Let's get the first day covered. Let's make sure we have it completely covered to get that, that triage piece where you can take back, sit back and take a breath. Mm -hmm. And then let's plan the week. And let's think about what it's going to look like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the things, we had a camper um, that was doing a, um, 
she was speaking at a fundraising breakfast for us. And it was a camper with spina bifida. Um, so that's spinal cord injury at birth. And she utilizes a, a wheelchair for transportation, for, for mobility. And so she's up there talking about her experience at Camp For All and how it made her feel independent, like she could do everything. And so when she left camp, she's like, I want to do this. I want to do this. And my friends go to this camp. And so she went to a church camp with her friends. And at the end of church, and they accepted her in, they knew who she was. At the end of church camp, she got the award for the best spectator. Oof. Because at camp, that's what she got to do. She got to sit and watch a lot of activities. Now, that's great as a for Camp for All Breakfast when she tells this story and talks about camp, right? So if you're, if you're a Camp for All staff member, development person who's waiting for donations, that's a great story. Yeah. If you're sitting there as a camp professional who loves the camp industry as a whole, you go, oh my gosh, Ugh. you totally missed the boat. And it was just because you didn't think about the end experience. How does this person get involved? And, and one of the things that we talk about here is universal programming. And and it, it has a lot of, I know people know that term, and it has a lot of phrases. The way I like to think about our universal programming is that we'll set up an activity and you'll have three different ways that you can do that activity and you get to choose. So one of those ways might be what, you know, a quote unquote adaptive way to do that activity. Um, and the other two might be more traditional way to do that activity, but everybody who does that activity, whether they need the adaptive uh, piece or not, gets to participate however they choose. Mm -hmm. So you can see somebody who doesn't need adaptive piece using the adaptive and somebody who you would think might need the adaptive piece doing it the traditional. It gives choice to the camper and helps them think about the process. I, I got off on a tangent off of your- uh, No, it's all good. But at least through day one. <laughs> because you bring up something really interesting that I've heard both of you, uh, Ruby and Kurt, sort of allude to. Um, uh, which is a, really about staff. And I'm not going to go stand on my soapbox, Jack. I, I know you and I talk about this all the time. I'm not going to talk about how, oh, everyone needs way more staff, blah, blah, blah. Everybody on this webinar has heard me say that like four or five times just in the last day. So I won't say that. But what I would like both of you guys to chime in on is what else do we give our staff? I mean, these are the folks we're putting on the front line Right. And we're saying in Ruby's example, we're saying, all right, like, hang tight, man. Let me go talk to mom for a second before she gets out of here. And for you, you're saying, Kurt, I just heard you say, OK, what, what are we going to do to get through today and then or get through this evening or whatever and then get into tomorrow? I mean, this is really heavy and intense on those staff members, especially if they don't necessarily for a lot of our more typical camps have the training. Right. Kurt, your staff probably have the training to sit there and, and you guys probably have way more staff than our than our typical camps so ruby what would you tell uh, a, a camp director for a very typical camp like what are some of the strategies for your staff in that moment while you're working it out while you're trying to figure out maybe a shortened stay or or some other strategies or whatever oh that's a hard question <laughs> um yeah, been practicing um so one, I'm going to not answer your question for a moment while I think about it, but one strategy that I used is that I uh, was fortunate to have a camp that served kids who had autism and ADHD that was just down the road from me. And we used to do a staff and, and director swap during staff training. So we, their director would teach my staff, my, I would teach their staff, each to our specialties. Yeah, and, and it, it was awesome because my staff came back with some more tools that I wasn't necessarily uh, as familiar with in teaching, but also they got this like, whoa, gratitude for the job that they had and some of the challenges they were probably not going to have to deal with, but still had a few tools for dealing with some of those challenges when they heard the stories from the other director. Um, in that moment, I think pushing that this is a growth opportunity, that there are you know, this is like life. Life is going to throw you unexpected people, unexpected challenges. Take a, a deep breath. This is not the end of the world. <laughs> like we, are, this is camp and we're going to figure it out. And so help me help you. What do you need right now to feel safe and good and feel like you can move forward? And I'm going to go talk to this parent on the phone or call my camp director friend down the road. And then I'm going to get back with you and we're going to make a plan. Um, but I think when you can pose it as a, this is an opportunity to try some new tactics and to grow, that uh, people tend to respond to growth, especially once they get in a calm state of mind. When they're freaking out, you know, you gotta calm them down first, but um, that's where I'd start. Well, you know, to add on to that, one of the things that I would add right at the end of that sentence is 
to talk about how we're going to get into a rotation pretty quickly with the other counselors in your cabin group uh, unit, whatever it is, right? Because what we desperately don't want is for one adult and one kid to like have worked it out over the, you know, half, you know, an afternoon or a day. And then now that adult thinks they're the only one that can sort of manage this kid and then all the stress is there and then we're talking about burnout in 48 hours uh you know and that's not good for the kid either so I, that's what i would sort of add to that kurt how would you what would you say on, in that moment you know what are some other strategies for all of our camp directors here as far as how do we help staff manage these these harder moments especially in that first 24 hours well i i think and and ruby said this too i think the first thing that we have to do is um give them the space and time so we have to figure out if they're if they're coming to us and saying hey this is overwhelming i don't know how to deal with this we, we can't give them uh you know a halftime pep talk that's that's not what they need right now they need they need real stuff right then and that's either either you or a lead staff member who has more experience going alongside them so, but somebody who knows how to do that because one of the things that can happen is I can come alongside you and because of the experience that I have with behavior and with with different types of disabilities I can jump in make some assumptions make some diagnosis not medical camp diagnosis and say okay this is what's gonna work let's talk and I can do all of that work but if I if I'm the one that jumps in and does that then as a staff member you're not gonna learn so the next time you won't be ready either. Um, if I'm, the, if you need to have somebody, whoever it is in the leadership, walk alongside them and then make suggestions. Why don't you ask them about this? You ask them what their mom does for this. How does this happen? Like, what are the questions that we need to ask? Okay, now that I've been with you, I know that we need to call mom and dad and ask these questions of them as well, depending on what the camper is. So let me get somebody to come walk with you. I'm going to go make those phone calls. I think the immediate thing is that they want to be heard and they know, want to know something's being done. Mm -hmm. How are we fixing this and, and how are we working on it? And then, like you said, Scott, too, I think we need to make sure that we've got that rotation of staff mm -hmm. so that, so that the, the camper has a regular camp experience. One of the things that we need to remember, the regular camp experience in our camp, whatever that might look like, right? That's what we want it to be. So this, whatever this um, camper has or whatever issue is going on that sets them apart, that you've had this, this thing going on with the staff member, let's make sure that we don't enclose them in a bubble and take away what happens with the rest of the camp experience. Mm -hmm. So let's make them part of the rest of the camp experience, but let's do that in a way that, uh, that makes sense. Now, these, these are, it's kind of general conversations. When you, when you talk to me about staff coming to me and saying, this is a big deal, nine times out of 10, that's a behavior issue. Mm -hmm. That's nine times out of 10. It's, it's, we didn't cover that in ages and stages and behavior management because none of the things that we talked about is working this child has down syndrome and they're just saying no and sitting down and i don't know what to do with that and how to, how to deal with that here are our guidelines and so that, that's typically the, the behavior if it's a physical we we often even if we're our camp isn't set for it, we oftentimes have ideas and concepts of how to get them from place to place and move them around and depending on their cognitive level they're able to help us and so um, the, the behavior issues can be very trying on staff, very, um, they, can, they can have safety issues both for the camper and for other campers. And so it's something we definitely need to surround Waterway, figure out, put a behavior contract together, whatever it looks like, and make sure that we're moving forward that way, but giving them the support. Absolutely. So how can yeah. we, if, just going from the proactive standpoint though, when this happens, when we're triaging or we're trying to deal with the situation, oftentimes, which it's just something we're doing on the fly, right? Um, and I understand that every case is different because every individual is different, but a challenge I would have for camp directors is how do we develop criteria or a workflow or a guide of everything we need to take care of when we have a camper who um, has, has different needs that we need to attend to or surprise needs, right? So we don't forget about these different things. Or so we have those, that question that Ruby asked us earlier at our fingertips. Or so if we're offsite, we have to go to a wedding, our assistant director, you know, can handle that. So I guess I would just challenge everyone to think about how do we like establish criteria for decision-making and how do we establish um, at least a process of how we're going to um, do all of these things that we're talking about? Because it's really hard in the moment to keep it organized. Sarah, I was going to ask you and Jack if there's anything going on in the chat that we should sort of curve back to 
um, while we still have a bit of time left with these guys. Or I can just keep talking. All of you are muted, so I'm just going to keep yep. talking. So well, I was reading the chat, so I'm <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, is there actually, Jack? You know what I was going to ask you? Is there um, something that you and Sylvia cover in the inclusion training uh, that kind of speaks to what Kurt was talking about, as far as having a leadership person, having somebody kind of model for everybody, as opposed to coming in and fixing things? I don't know if there is or not, and I, so this isn't a setup, everybody. I was just wondering. Yeah, one of the things that that Syl talks a lot about when she talks about doing this kind of thing is is finding someone on the staff that in the first day doesn't have typical kind of like direct responsibilities to take care of when kids arrive. So if that's a director or whatever, still calls them uh, inclusion specialists, someone that won't have to be called to go lead a meal or uh, make a parent phone call or something so that they can go and hang out with Ruby as Ruby is trying to work with someone new. Because on the first day, that's when we're getting hit with the most new stuff because we don't know the kids yet, right? So um, how do we do that? And then I want to do a big plug. Uh, I knew nothing about any, anything really before I started going to visit camps like Kurt uh, said to do. And I want to say, um, Kurt and Scott, I know you're already going to say yes to this, but would you be open? And I checked your website, so I know that there's like a lot of volunteer opportunities. So I think that okay. you're just going to say yes. Um, uh, I think a huge step would be I want to do a lot more inclusion at my camp. What do I do? Can I go personally or can I send someone to go volunteer with Kurt at Camp for All or at one of the partner organizations that you have that I can live every day in that space and see not just walking around the camp, but what does the sleeping arrangement actually feel like when kids are going to bed? What is going into the meal look like? What's the process for all these special diets that you're talking about? Because you mentioned all these special diets, but you still have 150 kids or 300 kids or whatever it is. We still have to figure that out. It's cool that you have, you know, so um, can I send a staff member? Can I go myself to Camp Tall Tree that Scott works with kids with autism in Michigan? Um, I'm in the South. Can I go see um, Camp for All and go work there for a week? and see what it's like. Um, and what's cool about the way that the school system works right now is that like, if you want to go see a camp in action that does this kind of thing, you can probably go somewhere else in the country, either before your summer or after your summer, or send someone to do that um, to, make, to make that possible. So Kurt, would you be open to the 42 attendees right now, maybe coming to visit you this summer? Yeah, absolutely, as long as it's on 42 different days. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. I'll take you all in the same week. All in the same week. Y'all can come. Everyone can come. Well, and, and so the, structurally, the difference is, you know, I don't hire counselors. Those are volunteers that come with our partners. So if you're looking at how to adapt activities and, um, and run the activities and lead adaptive activities, Come, you know, volunteer, figure out, we'll figure out a time for you to look around, see what we're doing, you know, depending on what you're looking for, what's the best time to come is. I will tell you, I feel like I don't, I feel like we do a really good job with special diets um, and we're only about 50% as good as I'd like to be. So we've got a lot of room to work on, but we have a special diets person focuses separately. So if you want to see how we do that and there are meals that we serve 63 diets just from the special diet standpoint. Wow. And so uh, if you want to see how they do that, um, other than their amazing staff, I would love to come show that around. If you want to see how the counselors do it at Camp for All, I can introduce you to our partners. And that's where Scott can kind of give you that experience as well. Also, I will tell you that special needs kindred group, I, I don't know that there's any of them that would say no to having you even just come observe. Even if you weren't able to volunteer, but you just want to walk around for a day and see it. And, and we'd love to do that. Um, yeah, absolutely. You come to my camp, no problem. You go, you, everyone can have a job, I promise. Um, yeah. I'm not doing any of the hiring, so I could just make all those kind of promises. It's great. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you both before we have to let you go here in another 15 minutes is about training. Um, now, you know, we're in December. We're looking at a lot of the things you guys talked about as far as how do we create the accommodations? How do we knock down some of these barriers? That sort of, that sort of stuff. What would you say are some of the priorities when it comes to not only the orientation piece, like now that I'm doing hiring between now and when I get my staff, 
physically on site, but what do I do when I have them? I mean, give us some ideas, some resources, those sorts of things around how do we train them up to get them functioning at the level we want them. Um, I think one question you might want to consider adding to your staff interview is um, like what does inclusion mean to you or um, when you look at our materials who do you see that's not represented uh, I think that would be interesting to get fresh eyes and returner eyes on that and if if an inclusion program is something you're considering uh, even if it's you're like I don't even know if I want to name it that yet but if that's something you're thinking about that can be an interesting way to start the conversation just to get some feedback. Um, and I, I also want to echo this idea of kind of the partner folks. Like the more I've been working in this consultant role, it's, you know, they're really, especially for medical needs, there, there is a camp for that. And so, and a lot of these camps are folks that are looking for um, maybe places to rent out to come hold their camp and so if you can find out who some of the people are that are involved there um, start some conversations with those folks now and whether it's they are putting together a handout for you or if they're gonna come during staff training or you know I mean I'm picturing like imagine getting several partners especially if you're in a, a more urban area where you might have a lot of different organizations or a hospital or something where they could provide a lot of folks you could almost do like a fair of um, you know like you have a a student activities fair but you can almost have one of those where there's tables with lots of different medical needs or um, whatever differing abilities that you have people from lots of different organizations to learn from I, my first summer working at camp we had somebody from the local epilepsy group that came and talked about seizures and what it was like to have one and what they needed and that has been so impactful to me like I was like oh I can handle this, you know, and so are there opportunities to get those people up in front of your staff and talking or providing resources really straight from the experts. Um, I think that that's something to consider and see if you can start building some of those networks now. You know, just to add on that, I would also say that don't worry about asking for that favor or for that information because a lot of those those exact groups are experts in hemophilia or uh, diabetes or whatever, but want more help on, well, how do I run camp? And that's where all of you are just experts, right? And so there is a lot that you can offer in that same conversation about, ooh, well, let me send you my staff manual. You're, oh, you're working on that? Oh, I just rewrote mine last year. Whatever the case may be, lots of people are interested in, in sharing like that and need help um, from in areas that you might not think they need help in. So. Um, Kurt, what about you? Oh, well, first off, I want to talk about what Deborah just put in the chat and remembering that when we talk, when we use the phrase special needs, um, it can mean lots of things. And so when we think about barrier free, we want to, we want to, I like, I like, you know, what's missing. I think the question then that we ask is what barrier, what, what barrier have we put up, whether that be, you know, somebody's sexual orientation with, you know, trans people in camping and the conversations we're having around that that's a barrier that's something that we need to look at how are we dealing with that and and and, and what are we what are we what do we do moving forward with that so so thinking outside of you know the child with autism and the child that uses a wheelchair so um i, I think for for training one of the things that we do first and i think when you're thinking about this overall you still do the same things as training. I won't get into a staff training session here, but you still have to think of the same things and that's what's the most important thing. And when the, in the scope of things, if you come to work for Camp For All, the, the most important thing is not how do you deal with somebody with a special need? The most important thing is how are we gonna work together as a team? How are we gonna think creatively? How are we, what are those things that we're gonna do? And so the first things that we deal with are all about those things. How do we build that team up? Because when you build that team up and teach them to be creative together, those triage moments, they work out on their own. They, hopefully they come and tell you about them, but, the, but they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll work them out on their own because you've built that team up. So that's the place that I would start. Um, I would also make sure that your face-to-face -face time is the most important time that you have. So if you're gonna if you're gonna train on a topic like uh, like epilepsy um, and you get the epilepsy foundation to come in, ha have them come in and, and show some videos, interact. Um, having somebody get up in front of staff like that is not is not gonna train them on how to deal with campers. You know, have a have a you know a 
uh, a day where you bring out campers with special needs, maybe from a local organization. Maybe if you've got the Epilepsy Foundation, they bring some campers and parents and go around and they talk to you about activities and how they would be able to do them. Um, so I think those are you know, kind of utilizing those resources, um, but also utilizing your training time in the very best way. What are you doing ahead of time? I, one of the things that I, um, it, having your staff sit down and fill out paperwork is the very first thing that they do when they arrive to camp is the least motivating thing I can think of for staff training, right? And so, so th those are all things that they can do before they get to camp. Make that, make that training time impactful and important and, and have it out. And, and I'm, I'm gonna go along with what Ruby said too, use your local resources. We're a camp for people with special needs and every week when we have a new partner group come out, the partner comes and talks to staff about those particular. And we do an overview during staff training, but, but they're the experts on those campers and whatever that concern is. And so we wanna hear it from the experts and, and really kind of talk details. And, and you know, one, I mean, they're, they're, even as far as how to use language, you know, people get, people get, you know, frustrated with, oh, you know, it's a camp for people with blind that, have, that were blind and I said, see you later, you know, and, and teaching people that those things are okay to say, like, you know, and, and not to get, not to get, too worried about those types of things. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're responsible for, to it, right? I, the, the thing that, I, the caveat I wanna put on what Kurt just said is also remembering something that he said at the very beginning of this webinar, which is, you know, and a kid is a kid is a kid, you know, or you meet one kid with X special need, guess what? You met one kid with that X special need, right? Just remembering that everybody is different and we're trying to come at these kids thinking about, well, what do you need to be successful? given all the labels, all the everything else that's sort of put on top of a kid, one of the things that we need to do is just like remove all that, look at what we're seeing in front of us and say, okay, well, what does this kid need to be successful? Whether we're talking about, like Kurt said, in this next hour, just getting to this evening or looking at the whole week or the rest of the summer, how long you may, you may be working with this particular child. So um, thanks for that. Uh, Sarah and Jack, is there anything else going on in the chat that we should be paying attention to in our last uh, few minutes here with these guys? No. The chat has been following the conversation very closely, I think. So huh. I don't think there's much outside of there, except there are a lot of dad jokes. And so it is a little hard <laughs> to keep up with what is well, content and what is a dad joke. Um, but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, you know, I think one thing that I was thinking about is just the question of budget and how a lot of this stuff seems scary from a budget standpoint. And I always say budgets are made up, right? Like they're a reflection of your and your organization's priorities. Like someone wrote it. The government doesn't like tell you for the most part like what your budget is. And I think it's just a reflection of your values in action at camp. Um, and so, okay, Mike, calm down. <laughs> um, I was like, I'm not saying anything like too funny about budgets. Um, so how, how do you, I think a lot of people on the call maybe don't have complete control over their budget. Um, so how do you make the case to your CEO or your board of directors or your boss um, that you should devote monetary resources toward breaking down those barriers, whether that's within staffing, within facility, training, you know, a lot of things we talked about today cost money. And even though you're on board or you might be on board as a camp director, it's like next level to make that case to someone that has more power than you. So I'm wondering what um, Ruby and Kurt would recommend in terms of advocacy. Well, I guess the, the, the place that I would start would be the, uh, going back to the mission and goals. Um, if, if your board and your, your, president or whoever, if they're, if they're directing budget money, um, if you've got a, a mission statement and what you're directing money to will help meet that mission statement and you can make that argument, I think that's the first argument to be made. I think, that, I think the second piece of that is that getting more campers and getting more PR and, and doing these kinds of things can have a bottom line effect. And so, I, doing some due diligence on what that takes. So that first camper that comes in that we didn't increase costs, but we did increase our expenditures, but then that got us more campers and down the road, we were able to cover those costs. That's not necessarily gonna be a first year benefit analysis. And if, if you think it's going to be, then go ahead and put it in there. But if you don't, don't say 
people are going to come back and say, hey, this, this budget, you didn't meet the budget. And, and bottom lines do matter. Budgets do matter. And so making sure that we can, we can make it affordable is important. I, I would also say, though, that a lot of breaking down barriers has, do, doesn't have huge costs associated with it. Now, you can, but it doesn't mean that you have to. And so I, I, the difference between our zip line, our zip line is hydraulic. We lower the zip line down, we put somebody on, we lift them back up and they go up and they zip. And that's great. That's $10,000. That, that doesn't necessarily fit everybody's mission. But a four to one pulley on the zip line is not $10,000. And there are processes that you can use to make that. We're doing it all the time. It makes more sense for us, but, but may, try not to overthink the costs that are associated with it. Yeah, and spending the money on the front end may actually save you money later on. Um, it's the, if I don't build a ramp somewhere along the way, that loophole is going to close in the, in the uh, building codes and you're going to have to build a ramp. So why don't I go ahead and build an accessible interest, uh, entrance from the get-go? That idea of universal design has been, uh, we posted some links in the chat about that, um, has totally changed how I look at programming now when that was brought to my attention. And that was brought to my attention through a session about um, transgender campers. And it was like, oh gosh, yes, add a second shower curtain for privacy. It benefits everybody. It's not just for the, you know, my one non-binary camper. Like, no, it's dumb. So, um, so I think that one of the ways you, you talk about it is we are turning away opportunities for income if we are not thinking about these adaptations and this sort of design. And what groups are we turning away by building only steps up to the dining hall or not having a paved path? Um, it may not be, it may not affect your summer camp, but it could really affect your bottom line through retreat groups or other groups that might come in and use your facility if you have a facility. Um, or if you're looking at, you know, really renting out your facility to other camps, right? It could make a big difference. So um, I, I think if you are willing to spend a little money on the front end, it will ultimately save you money long term. And I mean, can we just respect to everything kind of going back to what we sort of started talking about? I think we have to just as an industry get better at saying no, at, at saying I can't safely serve your kid. Now, there's all kind of I saw a couple chat comments about we got to be careful with the language we use and all this kind of stuff for sure. And have your lawyers look at it and whoever. And I just think if we're going to be compassionate people and we're trying to serve kids, we've got to get good. We've got to get better at figuring out like, okay, if this line to Kurt, to Sarah's point has been drawn for us in a, because of a budgetary reason, let's say, right? Okay, it's there, it's real. So we now have to be responsible to that. And we have to say, well, what can we reasonably accommodate within the parameters we've been given? And that means for almost everybody on this webinar, we have to get more comfortable with being in the place where we're saying, well, you know what, my, this program might not, might not be the best fit, let me help you with some other resources, whether it's a referral program or anything else. So I think that's just something we have to pay attention to. Um, we've only got about two more minutes. So I'd love for, um, uh, Kurt, let's start with you. Um, maybe give us a final thought and then tell us, um, all these folks are gonna be so interested in figuring out how to get to you now. So tell us like where they can find you and how they can email you and bug you or get on your dad joke, joke Twitter or whatever. There we go. Well, I had to throw one more joke up. Um, and it has to do with sign language. So I felt, felt like it fit the topic a little. Um, but uh, I think my, my last thought is that we all have some, some great resources. Um, I'm excited to go back and read the chat. Every once in a while I scanned over. Um, I, there's some really great ideas in the chat. And so knowing that this community of people has all these ideas, I think that the, the biggest takeaway is, I, I, I guess I would go with two big takeaways. One is utilize your resources, utilize your resources, reach out, think about it, bring people together, send me an email, um, utilize resources to figure out that problem solving. And then the second is that while your go-to answer should be to try to figure out a way to say yes. And, and so if you're the kind of camp that looks at this and you go, oh, I'm kind of, I'm sitting here and I haven't said yes a lot. Your go-to answer should be to say yes. Knowing that in your back pocket, there is always a reason, there is always uh, a time where you can go back and say no, that no, I'm going to give you a different resource. And so I, one of the things that I talk about when I do customer service is not actually using the word no, 
Um, but when a camper comes to my camp and if I've done all my due diligence and find out that they're not able to come to my camp, if I go back to that parent and say, here are the resources I found for you, here are three camps, I checked them out, I did this, I really think it would be good and it would be a better fit. I, I think you've gone a long way to build up a rapport with that parent and, and that's always a good thing. So use your resources and remember that uh, not every camp is for every person. And how do we find you, Kurt? Oh yeah, so uh, Kurt Pedeswa at gmail.com is my email or ha at happy camp director is my, uh, my Twitter handle. So feel free to tweet out some uh, dad jokes. My guess is that Ruby and I are going to keep them going for a while again. We've gone through stages. So this <laughs> is like one that maybe we can push all the way to ACA national Ruby. <laughs> dad jokes for days. That's there what it is. <laughs> days and days and days. Ruby, what about you? Give us like a final thought and then where we can find you. Um, I would just throw out there that we've said the term a lot about can we accommodate this camper? What can we give this camper? Um, take a moment to think about what will having this camper in your community offer to your camp community and what that can give you, what that can give your, what lessons there are to be learned. Um, so yes, camper first, 100%. And um, I remember getting to go visit Travis and Beth's old camp at Cairn and there are um, adults with special needs who are in their community and it's been a part of their culture for a long time and it was just like, this is so cool. <laughs> like, and nobody batted an eye and, and it was, it's just a part of the culture. And it was like, oh my gosh, what, what a cool uh, program that you have and this is part of it and it's just built into the fabric of the camp. So consider that too. Um, when we're, we're fearing, fear, being fearful, lean into that a little bit and think about like, what else is there to be had or offered or gained from this, what, what a gift it is. Um, you can find me, Ruby, at rubyoutdoors.com. My website is just rubyoutdoors.com. Make sure you get the S in there. Um, and I'm on Instagram at rubyoutdoors, and I'm on uh, Twitter as at rubylin85. Um, and yeah, happy to chat further. Lean into these conversations. It's good stuff, y'all. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I can't tell you how much we appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, Sarah, do you want to uh, take a minute to sign off as well? Yeah, tomorrow at 2 p.m. we have um, someone do a drum roll to buy me a little time. We have um, teaching camper behavior management. So we have Roz and Jed Buck, um, plus we have Jody Sperling. So that's going to be really fun and interesting. There, I promise tomorrow I'll share stuff. a little bit better when it comes to the behavior stuff. I you're, you're just not. bad at sharing. It's fine. I, That's when we're talking about behavior. I just I can't share, so I'm gonna be real He's, quiet. Tomorrow. Yeah, it's fine. We'll just I, I think I have the power to mute you, so I could just oh, yeah, do that if you're not yeah. sharing. Um, and then um, we have um, a conversation about data with Eric Wittenberg from Camper Machine. So really interesting thinking about how we can use some um, qualitative, quantitative data um, and data research to learn about our camps and inform our decision making, which I think is something that um, we're kind of bad at. So ready to get better at that and get Eric's, Eric's input. Um, so thank you. I, Jack, what's our total amount raised so far? Uh, $9,406. $9, wow. So and we really want to get to 10,000. So it's super exciting. So tell your camp friends. Yeah, just share the, all this on the internet. Come on. Yeah, come on. Oh, on, the internet. on the internet. Sarah, where can everybody find you? Um, we are at the summercampsociety.com. Um, and on Instagram at the Summer Camp Society. Very good. Well, again, thank yeah. you all. My name is Scott Arzala. You can find me at thecampcounselor.com. Uh, and then on Instagram as well, but I don't know my Instagram handle, so I think it's just at the summer or at the camp counselor, I guess. Darby can put it up there for me because I think she knows it. Um, but again, thank you all so much. We can't tell you how much we appreciate this. Stomping Ground appreciates it. All those kiddos are headed to their brand new home. Appreciate it. it next summer in the summer of 2020. So thank you guys so much. Um, and we'll see you all tomorrow at 2 p.m. Hi, friends. Thanks so Have much, Kurt Ruby. We're doing an inclusion program this summer and you helped us a lot. So thank you so much. Wow. Bye guys. <laughs>